Welcome to The Boneyard. This is a podcast about Mythgard. This is episode two, Attack of the Closed Beta. My name is Flake and I will be your host. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Mark Theus. Blake, pleasure to be here as usual. And we are happy to bring you another episode of The Boneyard. And we want to start the show by thanking our sponsors, Team Rankstar, Inked Gaming, and all you wonderful listeners. Thank you so much for making this possible. All right. Well, it is uh, really a great time for Mythgard as we are sort of dipping our toes into a closed beta. And the uh, real fun begins, I guess, today. Uh, On today's show, we'll be discussing the upcoming Champions Ladder system, the future of esports for Mythgard, and uh, a whole lot more. And we'll also be welcoming Eolus to the show to share her insights and experiences and give her thoughts on the game and what's to come. Eolus is a streamer and content creator with Team Rankstar and already has a bunch of content out there for you all to enjoy. All right, Proton Torpedoes are locked on targets. Let's start our attack run, play the music, and let's enter the Boneyard. All right, so this episode is a special episode, not just because it's our second one. We survived the first amazing Congratulations, Martheus. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but we are going to be also uh, diving into closed beta, which actually opened up an hour ago as of when we're recording this. So some of us are really, really itching to sort of dive in. You guys are already having a couple days under your belts in terms of getting it done. But closed beta is ready to go for all those who enjoyed alpha. Open beta following, I believe, on September 19th. Does Correct. that sound right to you, Mark? Yes, 100%. Beautiful. So that is, I guess, the state of Mythgard right now. It's uh, a, a wide open area for people to dive into now for for keeps as it is what everything that you do now there is no erase button it is etched in stone so go ahead blaze your path and claim your glories that way but uh, i also want to introduce to the show our special guest eolus eolus is a content creator and streamer for team rank star hailing all the way from new zealand uh she is coming from uh other card games, uh, the other schools, Legends, I believe, is where you blazed your path. Eolus, welcome to the show. Thank you. A blazing a path sounds so much more impressive than just she plays like Legends. Like, <laughs> well, it, man, yeah. I, fe- I feel like I feel really important now. I've blazed a path through Legends, and yeah, now I'm sort of diving into Mythgard. Well, we need to, I mean, you and I are kind of in the same vein, Mark as well. We're streamers of card games. So I suppose when you're trying to, at least for myself, explain to people what I do, I have to make it sound as epic and and incredible as possible. So I'm (laughs) going to pass along sort of the same uh, courtesy that I do to myself when I tell my parents just what's going on. I, I downplay everything. I'm like, oh, you know, I play some cards. People come and watch me. Mom's like, all right, okay. <laughs> no idea what that means. Yeah. Well, for myself, it's more like, all right, but are you eating? Yes, mother, I'm eating. <laughs> yes. Who's feeding you, God damn it! You live 500 miles away. Where are you? Did, Did you, you win the myth guards? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you make the hearthstones? Yeah. No, mom. Oh, bliss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I I for those if ever my mom discovers the internet beyond Google um or Dr. Oz, then I'm I and she finds this podcast, Mom, I love you and uh, I love you very much. And has yes, she, I'm eating. Has your mom ever seen your stream? Uh she has. She w- has watched my stream in the past. Not my stream necessarily, but she has watched me cast uh Gwent tournaments. Oh, okay. So that's a yeah. good question actually. You, you yeah. know, it's like in terms of your 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 parents watching you do what you do uh you know how in tune are they because some of them they'll some parents watch religiously or or will yeah. actually know a lot about it what's that relationship with you and your family uh my mom is pretty cute with it she she hasn't watched that i'm aware of because i don't um i don't hide the fact that i stream but i'm also not in a position where i sort of advertise it in my day-to-day business um I'm pretty identifiable through my real name with work and things. And so it just sort of grays, like a little bit of a gray area of people might accidentally dox me, basically, I think is the the worry that I have. Um, but no, mom's, mom's really sweet with it. She's always like, I get a message like every couple of weeks going, what's the name of the game that you play again? So she's clearly telling someone what I'm doing in some way, but she forgets the name every single yeah. time. Um, I have little cousins who will pop in and watch because they're they're savvy enough to have found me on the internet. Um, yeah, but no, the family, I think they're generally supportive. They just don't get it for the most part, which is probably my fault. 
I feel like oh. I should, I could include them a wee bit more. Though. No, I think that's probably pretty common. My, my mine's kind of in the same boat where they, they're supportive of what I do, but they're also like, that's nice. You know, <laughs> like yeah. they, they don't hundred percent get. I, I keep trying to push for like little follower goals and stuff. And I keep thinking, man, if I engaged like people that I know in person and said, Hey, I'm streaming, like, I feel like I could really boost my followers here, but no, can't do yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's that's part of it. I mean, there's always the the amount of you can sort of dive into it and and kind of explore the IRL aspect as from a marketing perspective and say like, yeah. hey, you know, you might like me in this role. How about in this role? But at the same time, then there's always the the part of my parents were like, well, you could have been a doctor. That could have happened. You could have been. A, how many hours have you put into this game? Yeah, well, that's that's a pilot's license right there. That's a pilot's license. There, yeah, it's a difficult it's a difficult balance. But I'm very happy to say that my parents, because I had a corporate job, I did that thing for years and you know for for several years, and I, I was very successful at what I did. I had a good rapport with the company. I had a good path following my dad's footsteps in the same business that he was in. And then I said. Yeah, but uh, the opening packs is so cool. So, <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's it's it's really cool to to see that you know there people can have this dichotomy in their life of having a professional life and then a streaming life, which in technically is also uh, a you know a, a professional life to a degree as well. And for you, you know, you you came from the Elder Scrolls Legends, and I want to know what necessarily, first of all, when you started in Mythgard, how you discovered it, and what attracted you to the game to stick with it and, uh, and you know, push forward uh, on this platform. I was thinking about this this morning because I thought to myself, you might ask a question like that, um, especially the part about what got me to stick with Mythgard because it's not something that people who know me would think that I'd typically stick with. Um, the reason being is that it's quite a complicated game. It's quite complex. But anyway, um, way, how did I find it? Oh, uh, TRS. Uh, we had a link shared in the TRS Discord um, that said, hey, there's there's a game out that's in alpha at the moment if anyone wants to try it. And I said, sure, why not? It was like October last year. Um, it was like not too long before Twitch got, that's how I remember it. Um, and I started playing it and there's something that draws you in about the game. The story draws you in. And this was pre-voice acting as well, like when I started it. Um, the story draws you in. The artwork is fantastic. But the developers are just next level. They are so friendly. Um, they've been helpful from the beginning, very patient with me and like willing to talk to me one-on-one -on -one since October last year. Um, when they found out I was coming over to TwitchCon, they invited me to their offices, which, because um, they're quite close to that area, it's only sort of half an hour away from where TwitchCon was. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't make it because of the schedule and not having a car in the States. Um, but yeah, they've just always been really kind and welcoming. And I think that was a big part for me of why I stayed, because things that are really important to me are community and, and developers and enjoying a game, of course, but like the community is core for that. Um, yeah, the game is tricky. So for me, I feel like I should have given up on it a long, a long time ago, but I've persevered and I'm so glad that I have because it's such a rewarding game to play. Like nothing feels better to me than making progress in Mythgard because I feel like it's not luck when you're making progress. Like you have to work hard to do so. Right. And you, you have, um, you know, you've established a, a quite a sort of a, a pedigree in card games because you, you have an established... Uh, following a content and uh, a career, let's say, in the Elder Scrolls Legends, and mm -hmm. and to pull away from that, and I, I understand what you're talking. And for instance, for something that I myself, uh, you know, I, I wrestle with the idea now and then of of playing various card games uh, regularly. You know, be it Gwent, Magic, uh, Mythgard, and I know that sometimes it's difficult for someone to just completely uproot from something that they've put so much time and effort and love into and then come and completely trans translate themselves to another. I know Mark, you've done this recently where you've uh, sort of, you, you dove into magic recently and now Mythgard probably more, I would imagine more. Uh, yeah. You know, hardcore, let's say. Yeah. And like, like Eola says, and she's definitely not wrong in any of what she's saying, because I, I feel the same way as she does in that 
The developers are exceptionally communicative and and kind and responsive. Uh, the game offers levels of complexity that don't make you feel like you're a, a pile of crap for not understanding things. Like it's yeah. very like like well like like you're saying, Yolis, it's yeah. it's something wherein I you you feel the you enjoy coming out of the struggle successfully. You feel enriched for being able to win these complex games. And Mark, yeah. I want to know what your feelings are about jumping from putting in thousands of hours of into Gwent and then into, you know, now Magic and Mythgard and what attracts you to the same game as well. Yeah, I, I think actually, uh, uh, you know, saying that Mythgard is more complicating is is the right assumption. But I think that that coming from other games makes it easier to go into Mythgard. I think if Mythgard was my very first card game, I might not want to play just because of the fact that it's a it's it's more complicating and it would be a little off putting. But the tutorials are really good and make it a little bit easier to understand as you go and you can start slow and all that. But coming from uh, Gwent and then Magic and Hearthstone, uh, I kind of felt like I already had a little bit of an edge because it felt like a lot of those elements already put together. A lot of keywords that uh, that are used in other games, you know, like, uh, you know, in this game, they call it first strike. But in Mythcar, they call it alpha strike, you know, like things like that, where it's like these are defender. You know, those are all words that are used in other games. Maybe it's the same mechanics, basically from other games just call it something different so that's what makes it probably more difficult for someone who's coming from other games uh but but overall i think that coming from coming out of magic into Mythgard was probably the easiest transition because of how similar those two are i think not Is, not not really with lands though obviously that's that's completely different but just like the way right. the colors work and and the mechanics but where does Mythgard necessarily fit in terms of complexity like if you were to sort of dish out tiers of complexity to various if you wanted to make a power rankings from most difficult and complex and layered to you know most basic and user friendly or mm. you know uh, i mean it's difficult to kind of qu uh, qualify them yeah. in terms of what makes something complex like something could be complex but easy to master whereas something could be complex but you know you're 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 struggling with it and like where would you put Mythgard on the on the echelon like would oh you boy. put it above magic below magic above gwent below gwent? and i know that there's a lot it's of tough to say that are I, I i would personally i think i would put it as far as like if i'm looking at it from someone who was like brand new i would probably put it under magic only for the fact that the card pool is smaller so it's a little easier to uh figure out what you like and stick with it you know, the problem with magic is getting a collection and then understanding with the tons of cards and expansions, which which cards are actually worth playing. And I think in Mythgard, oh, that's a little easier. But in terms of gameplay, I'd probably say magic is a little bit easier. Well, I, that's tough to say. I think they're right. They're kind of neck and neck because Mythgard is so important about where you place your cards and, and what lane they put them on. In magic, it's more important about your sequence. So I, I don't know. That's kind of neck and neck for me. See, um, just you just really struck a, a nerve with me there because I've, I'm just starting to learn paper magic and I've got pre-constructed lists and I'm starting to build a collection now for a pauper league. And it's like, where do you begin? Yeah. Like, Ooh. well, like where, paper's where, a whole nother world. <laughs> I like, yeah, I like, I go onto like local buy sell pages or I go into places and I'm like type in like magic cards and it's just like this overwhelming volume yeah. of different yeah so no i totally understand with the, the smaller pool of cards and yeah so then and i i completely sympathize with you there i jumped into magic in both paper i mean i played maybe about 20 years ago because a, a friend of mine had a collection and i in, in retrospect when you think about it you had like a small fortune in your hand that you were just tossing around a table and you had never knew about it at the time but <laughs> um jumping into magic around the dominaria uh release which was about a year and a half ago it was the same exact overwhelming um experience of how far back do i go how far forward you know like i like where do i start and yeah. for yourself you're playing in a popper league so for those who are, are unaware popper is uh you build decks that only have common cards um common rarity cards in them so uh you have that as a little bit of a boost because at least the collection that you're going to build is going to be rather easy to to accumulate from a price perspective but at the yeah, same time I think that's why my friend sort of steered me in that in that direction a wee bit but the fact that there's an, an entire league that you have access to is really good because where yeah. i play 
paper. Nobody plays Popper. Everybody just walks around with these five hundred dollar decks in their pocket, and, you're, and you feel completely outclassed. And and that's the fact of the matter. It's just the way it is. And that's what, what kind of was re- I was very reluctant about jumping in and jumping in at a point where there was still two or th- like two uh, sorry three or four sets in reverse that were still standard legal that you had to catch up on, and it was an absolute financial nightmare. But now that Mythgard is kind of jumping in. Uh, it's it's right out of the gate today, uh, mm-hmm. today being uh, September 10th. Um, everybody gets this, this, the beginning point. Well, I say everybody, everybody who's beginning today, because those who start in a year from now might have some backup, back catching up to do. But the fa- mm-hmm. fact remains is that for those who jump into Magic today or those who jump into, you know, Hearthstone today or or whatever, they have so much catching up to do, whereas the popularity of those games and that jar, the CCG jar, when it was released or when these other games were released four or five years ago, or in Magic's case, 25 years ago, they weren't that popular. So people were not aware of the jar necessarily, whereas now people are probably hungry to find a domain that they can get in at the ground level and have that sort of equality moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's a really exciting part about this, but I still am very frightened for you to say that you're jumping into magic now from a paper perspective. So Godspeed yeah. on that. It's I rewarding am, for sure, though. Yeah, I know. That, I know that I've derailed and gone off off Mythgard briefly, but the only yeah the only thing that I still think is quite funny is uh, I have an acquaintance or you know friend or acquaintance who is a uh, Magic Hall of Famer, and he's helped me like he's come on a legend stream before and happy to chat about legends i've tried to get him into Mythgard, by the way but he's quite busy but then i've asked him before about like hey well what about if i wanted to learn magic and stuff and he's just like his reaction to someone who is brand new to magic you know trying to like start that from the beginning he's like uh i re- i really don't have the time for this <laughs> <laughs> like you've got to get it up to a certain level so i send him pictures of the list that people have built me and yeah that's cool but it's um it's the the reaction of like, oh gosh, you're starting from from the beginning. Let someone else get you up to speed first. Well, there's a, a nice support system, but like you said, just the fear in someone's eyes when you sort of toss it out there and say, hey, I'm thinking about joining Magic. Because to them, the fear is not necessarily about what that means for you specifically, but also what that means for them in terms of getting you set up and all the time that they're going to have to take to get you to sort of steer you in the right direction. I remember that when I jumped in, the questions that I had and like going in from scratch and i must have asked two dozen questions to someone over the span of a week before i finally said okay i'm gonna do it it's weird it's like it's like buying a lexus like it's insane like in terms of just the, all the questions you have to ask the shopping around you have to do and making sure like ask someone who's owned a lexus is it should i have a is it a bmw i want like it's insane in that regard and I, mark you don't play paper right no, I, I mean, I've thought about it, but then like I look at the price of even just like some of the cards that I enjoy. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not good. I mean, I, I'm interested in watching it, though. I watch it on Twitch all the time. Remember I told you I, I watched uh, one of their weekends. I was like, I had no idea what was going on, but it was exciting. Like things yeah. like the people are flying all over the board. T- cards are being turned sideways. I'm like, what is going on? It's just crazy. Well, and those are those are uh, those are high or you know top tier competitive matches that you're watching and and it's a good time now to sort of discuss the fact that Mythgard itself is going to be revamping or improving upon the existing ladder system that they have uh it was announced yesterday i believe by rhino talking about uh a revamp to the ranking system the ladder system being that they're adding a champions tier or a champions ladder uh, down the line uh, that they're still working on. As they say, it's a uh, it's a quote-unquote work in progress, and they're working on uh, what that'll mean and what the implications of that will be. But basically, if you hit the top tier ranks in Standard Ladder, you will be added into, uh, uh, like, for instance, in Hearthstone has Legend, in, in, in uh, Gwent there's Pro Ladder, and in Magic there's Mythic Rank. It's an ELO, it's a global ELO, where that you are then classified and ranked against all your competitors um i w- Eolus, where did you were playing a lot of uh competitive uh myth guard if i'm not mistaken right well i played a lot of the rank system definitely because i wanted to get through uh to mithril their highest um well their previous highest uh ranking system but uh highest part of the ranking system rather um but i wasn't able to participate in a lot of the tournaments the community run tournaments and things but you, you i, you, I you, did you, one Oh, and how did, how did that go? 
well, I didn't finish very high, but I had like this really amazing highlight reel moment and I still bring the clip up all the time because the reactions of the commentators are like my favorite thing ever. So <laughs> like my one claim to fame in a tournament ever. And it happened specifically because I was running an, an anti-enchantment list and I've queued into the only person who was running enchantments. <laughs> and it was like, I lost to everyone else because my list was just not strong enough in any other way. But I queued into this person. And I was like, well, 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 <laughs> what do we have here? <laughs> so yeah, that was that was my one crowning moment in a tournament. Well, that's an exciting, like mm. it, it's a highlight reel, right? Which is what a lot of uh, these, you know, uh, when it comes down to these, big tournaments that's what a lot of at least from the organizers perspective it's great to have good matchups and whatnot but the fact that first of all you sort of queued in with non-meta i don't want to call it jank because jank is it was pretty as, janky something i've built i thought it was pretty cool but it's yeah i'm not a builder i'm a pilot so there you go well <laughs> and and that's the best part about it and, and when you get that perfect matchup you have these big moments and that's kind of what these developers want when it comes to these turn these tournaments mm -hmm. and now there's this competitive tier this competitive rank and so i i don't know how the entrance into it or the acceptance into that tier will what what that would preclude would it mean hitting the mithril rank and getting and then you're automatically then sort of whisked into this other ladder of champions mode i would imagine that's what it is mark i don't know what you think this would uh yeah. I, i'm actually surprised like, by it because i thought myth mithril was their pro rank in a sense but it sounds to me like they want it to be they want to be like, okay, you can, you got yourself to Mithril, which is a big achievement. And then champions rank is like, to me, it sounds like if you qualify there, now you're in their pro ranking and you might even see something like, well, you don't drop out of champion or you go right back to Mithril or something like that. Uh, that's what it sounds like. Maybe they're trying to set up something for an esports kind of side of it. It yeah, could be, I'm not sure yeah. about whether or not you drop are going to drop back or not. I know that um, at least from the alpha to beta transition, the drop has been only back one. So potentially mm -hmm. that's going to be common for each season that you just drop back to the next. Um, I think, what am I calling it? A tier, I guess the next yeah. like yeah, it's a tier, yeah, I guess. The next yeah. one below. Um, so I'm not sure with the champions ones. I in my in my opinion, I would hope that it would reset less regularly than a normal season. But that sort of with a, with a caveat of me not knowing how long they're going to have these seasons lasting. But I would think that maybe the champions needs to build up maybe over the course of a year or something like that. A, a, more of a significant time for people to be able to hold on to these spots and support a tournament scene. Because if it's going to reset as quickly as normal ladder and you're just dropping back, then what's the difference between that and a standard tier? Maybe it'll work. that yellow reading. It may well work more like the Gwent system where it's uh, the their pro, their pro season lasts for two months. Actually, I don't know if they still do it this way, but before it was their pro season was lasting for two months and the regular season was lasting one month. So maybe it's yeah. going to be something like that where champion is you stay there for two, you stay in that for two months and you uh, you don't drop out of that when the season resets and you just keep going. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's that kind of system. That's what I that's what I was thinking and I think that comes from the legend side of things where our seasons are the the calendar months and you know everyone works their way up as high as they can and then at the end of every month everyone gets set back and if you're in legend you get set back to rank five same as everyone from rank four and up and then you move your way up again the only thing that they have is a top 100 list that gets published by Bethesda there's not some sort of ongoing you know, there's nothing that's recording people's high finishes over a long period of time. There's no, like, global ranking system that continues on. And so I would like it, potentially, if Mythgard had that that happening. Right. It just I, rewards people for consistency. I believe that there would not be a, a system that would kind of be ongoing. If there's going to be a, a, a re a reset of it i believe it's gonna be uh first of all i think that it's just that there's this giant thirst now for people to see where they can go and uh, just the giant esports scene in general across all genres have now uh exploded into the mainstream and pop culture and whatnot where people want to see where they rank on something because you could by playing by yourself, you know, on your phone or wherever you are in a particular game on your console, you might think you're the best. But when you're you, you don't know that until you actually have a number associated to your name. And I think that that now has kind of uh, been 
a little bit of the the spice that games crave a lot of games that come out now that have a one-on-one or where you play against other people the first thing that people usually ask is what is the the you know is there a ranking system and and whatnot and i know that i'm the same way a lot of the times if i'm just playing for instance overwatch or uh when i used to play halo I would just not be as interested to queue into casual games as I was to be queued into ranked games because there was something on the line. And I think that uh, uh, a champion's tier now is going to be treated in the same way that for those who enter champion's tier, um, you will be, you know, you will be put into this new ladder where you will progress on that ladder, play people within that ladder and be given a rank. And at the end of every season, a season being either whether it be a month or two months, you get a certain amount of points, we'll call them champions points for the sake of argument. And then for this, you know, over the course of a a season or the year, the people with the most champions points get invited to a big tournament. And then that's how it kind of goes. But I I think without a reset of that, you know, kicking people, everybody out of it every month or every season and saying, all right, start over. And those who made it in get a, a sort of a head start. You guys start at, you know, level five, like you said, for legends and whatnot. And then you progress from there. Um, if, I don't think it should not reset at all, but do you not think it should be longer than a standard season? I don't know why I have that in my brain, but I it, really focused on the mm, the idea of it being longer than a standard season. I don't know why. Depends on what the grind's like in, in that. Yeah. Like in Gwent, it was kind of, it had to be two months because you had to play a minimum of like, what was it, 500 games in four different factions Whoa. or something? Yeah, well, so those, you had to be two months. <laughs> yeah. Those were a small select amount of people who, uh, and I tell this I tell this little mini story, kind of uh, whenever someone asks me about pro aspirations, and I said the day I realized that I'll never be a pro player was the day that I missed the first two days of a season and was already 300 games behind the leader. Yeah. And I was like, oh I, 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 yeah, it was pretty I nice. literally... It was insane. I was out of town. I was in Minneapolis visiting some friends. And I remember that the season began on the day that I left. So I didn't play. And I remember at being at the airport two and a half days later on my way home, getting ready to, I'm like, I have some work to do. I'm going to play all night, get in like a solid 40 or 50 games overnight, maybe then go hit the next day. And I looked and the leader already had about 300 games under his belt. And yeah, I said, pretty wild. This, is not, this is not for <laughs> me. I said, I cannot do this. I have a job. I have this, I have that. I can't do it. Yeah. But I, I agree with you in that regard that I think that um, seasons probably should be long enough where enough people can get into it and enough people can make a push from there. But to Mark's point, we don't know what the grind's going to be like. We don't know whether it's going to be a matter of it's going to take me three days to hit it, to hit champions tier if I really, really put my mind to it, or it's going to take me two to three weeks to hit it. And then I have a week to, you know, to sort of situate myself on, on that global ladder. So I would like to see what it's like first to hit Mithril. And you've done it, Eolus. So you could probably. Yeah. And how long did that take? Like, it, and, and. Don't use me as, don't use me as an example because I, um, one, I didn't play it nearly as much as what some people did. So there, there are two things, the two ways that I see it. One is that it took me, if you think about from how I started, it took me nearly a year because. I played it for that long and there was no reset during that time, right? But maybe for the beginning part of it, I did a lot of gauntlets and a lot of um, like PvE type play because what my time zone was difficult to get matches too. But I became absolutely terrified of facing other players for a bit because they just annihilate me and you lose so much rank points against them. Um, so I'm not sure if I'd have like a, a time frame to use i'm going to go out and say that i potentially had less games to get to mithril than what some people did because of just my i just played that much less than what others had done um but i also had to play a lot of pve games to make up for time differences um i don't know maybe the push i'd have to go back and look on clips because i really celebrated reaching gold i really didn't think i was going to get to gold and then i massively over celebrated getting to mithril i cried <laughs> um, oh that's, that's like nice. yeah that's... That, you have a nice clip of that actually oh it was so difficult and i tried so hard and so for i guess for people who are listening who haven't been part of alpha because of the difference in my time zone and the small community and the way that the ranking system works is that you could elect to also match with ai um while you're like on your climb 
um, so that you can actually play the game basically instead of waiting for someone else in the world to to wake up and, and play for you. Um, and also the casual and ranked queues were um, intertwined, which is another issue that I had, but that's fine. That's fixed now. Um, so what would happen is I would be queuing up um, for games. I would play, say, four or five um, AI games in a row, and you get, depending on which ranking you're in, you get between five to ten rank points for each of those wins. And then as I'm falling asleep, end of the night, I'd do one final game, and I'd queue into a Mithril player, and I'd lose probably about six games worth of AI. So oh, it was a very, like, it was a very, like, uh, anxiety-inducing time for me because I got up to 97, like, more than once. So, like, as um, you guys know, the ranking system has, you know, bronze, silver, gold to mithril. And within each system, there is, you know, um, bronze 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and silver and gold has the same. And you need 100 rank points to get through each of those individual numbers before you move up to the next one. So I'd be at like 97 G10. And then I'd lose a game back. I'd lose like 60 roll, like, like sixty rank points over like two losses. And so it was a very, <laughs> very stressful time getting back up to that top again. And yeah, I queued into an amazing mithril player who's been around for forever. And I was just like panicking the entire game. I was like, this is it. I'm just going to go all the way back down to the bottom again. But yeah, now, tried on stream. Oh, well, the emotion does certainly get to you. I know that Mark, you hit, you hit, uh, you know, you've hit tops. You've hit, you've been legend in, in, in uh, Hearthstone. You've hit mythic in, in, I know that the, when I, you know, when I hit, those various, you know, sort of the top of the mountain, so to speak, for the first time in, in various games. It's it's a it's yeah, a it's, it's a good feeling. It is a good well, feeling. I, well, especially for people like us, because there's a, and I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that this it's extra special for us, and it's not special for others. But this is something where we kind of cut our teeth in terms of what our this is our jam. This is our business. This is what we do uh, in certain cases for a living. Is we we entertain and and play these games and having, you know that under your belt like i leave in a couple hours for a flight to go cast the tournament and i know that if i went there and i was not a top ranked player you get extra criticism on it and for us as be it content uh, you know content creators or streamers or whatnot you you sort of like to have a little bit of that clout under your belt a little bit of that uh swagger to say i've been there i've done that and you know so i kind of it's like an extra little shield that you can carry when people want to question your credibility on something. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just the way it is. And not everybody is going to kind of attack you on these things. But um, the other benefit of this competitive ladder is even though we do not necessarily know what the implications will be about placing on it. Like if you place number one at the end of a season on champions ladder, we still have no idea what that's going to entail in terms of, uh, repercussions on that person's career or, or whatever at beyond that. But we could probably assume based on the fact that uh, on our previous episode of the Boneyard, Leo was here, the community manager from Rhino uh, for Mythgard, and he discussed the fact that there are indeed plans and intentions to kind of cultivate an esports scene within Mythgard. And uh, I think we can all agree, right, that Champions tier is most likely the setup for finding the the cream of the crop to play in these yeah. tournaments sure for yeah sure. for sure and uh, i mean finding you're going to want to find the top players to play in these things obviously we don't know anything about what those tournaments will be what's on the line etc uh but i just want to talk to you guys about uh, a little bit about the esports scene and what to you would make uh like what's a good schedule for esports what do you want to see from the esports schedule for Mythgard? Sure. Do you want me to start? Because I probably have the least to stick to say on it, just because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm just not an expert on the subject matter at all. Well, absolutely. Listen, it, it's, it doesn't matter. It, it's not so much about, you know, we're not we're, experts we're, either. <laughs> so. Yeah, we're not, we're definitely not as experts either. We're, we're, you know, Mark and I are just two dudes who are, who have a passion for this as you do. So it, a lot of it is not necessarily our educated opinions on it or educated guesses, but more so just what we'd like to see. So uh, by all means, Yellis, you, you lead the charge here. 
Yeah, so so I'm a I'm a ladder player and I don't tend to participate in tournaments mostly because of time zone and things, but I think that they are incredibly important for a community. Um and I think that especially fostering the the competitive side of it, um, that actually makes ladder amazing as well. You think of all those cool deck builds that you get to see um come out of of, of tournaments. Um I'd love to see something monthly from like and at least if if the rhinos aren't running it um that they're sponsoring or they're they're really involved in a monthly tournament um that is you know potentially also adding points towards this big like finale at some point over a year like a big like final series or something miss con um yes (laughs) um i'm gonna go with a valkyrie um but like yeah, I don't know. I feel like they, they just need to have something that's happening regularly. I've seen it too often talked about in Legends where people are just so disappointed with the lack of the competitive scene even existing. Um, there's only one uh, Master Series run you know, by Bethesda every year. And so I think that if there can be more Rhino, you know, Mythgard-sponsored tournaments over a year building up to one big party, um, one big finale would be awesome. Well, a party it sounds good. Flyover. Yeah, party sounds great. I've sent them. I've sent them chocolates. Um, when last week, week before, like I sent a whole bunch of like a Kiwi Care package through to the Rhino team to to welcome them into Beta and say thank you and congratulations. And so I think that gives me an automatic end to any <laughs> any finals. Wow. That is a that's a golden sure ticket that, right there. Yeah, yeah, pretty sure that's like top ten, like easy. Oh <laughs> my gosh, absolutely! So you're already in Champions, uh, Champions yeah. You're already in Champions yeah. League. That's right. Yeah, you got the card back to everything, dude. That yeah. is a great idea. Uh, I'm also <laughs> introducing the flake tier of uh, everything, so I will accept all your chocolate donations. Uh, you can send them directly to my face at all times. <laughs> I um, just like I just I don't know I I I like to. I think a lot of people, especially as content creators, so I think it's important for you guys as well to recognize it, and I'm sure that you do, but there are a lot of content creators who don't, is that whenever you are dealing with publishers and developers, you're always asking, can I have help with this? Or, you know, can I get a shout out for this? Can I get some, you know, card packs to give away? You know, like you're always reaching out for them. You're always asking them for more content stuff. It's always happening. I think there's a bit of a disconnect, and sometimes people tend to forget that there's people that you know like that's their job they have to go home at the end of the day and that's what they do and like you know they're working their butts off to get these like games and things out to us and so I kind of pride myself on acknowledging uh, who's who's doing what behind the scenes and knowing what they're up to and um what they're working on and I don't know just recognizing them as people so I like to send them I just sent them yeah a whole bunch of stuff with a card just congratulating them on going through to beta and thanking them for their patience with me and it's not the first developer I've done it to either I, I just it makes me sound like such a kiss ass but I just like I want them to know that there are people who understand like how much work they're putting in for us to do this like to be able to play these games I don't think it's a I mean I mean I know you're you say it's I'm not trying to be a kiss ass it's not a matter of being a kiss ass it's a matter of fact that a lot of the times these people put in um, you know, years of work into something and they they are probably today celebrating privately, you know, when they're not answering a million questions about clo- about closed beta open. But like, this is a huge day for them. This is something that they've all been waiting for. This is a, 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 a definitely a circle date on their calendar, this open beta and, you know, the complete package when that gets sort of gone there. So I'm sure uh, it, it's an absolute necessity that we have to understand that what we yeah, they, ask they of like them. Answer our, they like answer our questions at like 2 a.m., you know. I've had oh. before where I ran out of codes to give away and I sent a message asking if I could have some more. Um, basically because of my hours, they were often sleeping, so I was able to give out the codes in the Discord just for just, I don't know, made it a lot easier. And um, yeah, they'd like reply at 2 a.m. with like a handful of codes. I'm like, please go to sleep. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Why are you awake right now? Yeah, they do I answer it ungodly uh, hours. It, they're they're crazy. <laughs> and, and like, I, I say that with the most loving, you know, mm-hmm. uh, sprinkle of uh, of love that I can. But uh, it's insane. Actually, I messaged today Leo. I just messaged him and said, "Hey, uh, I know you're busy. I have three things. Number one, thank you for everything you do. Number two, uh, congratulations on this hard work that you've put into the beta. And the third one was." 
Uh, I hear that there's a way to get this on my Android. Whenever you have time in the next two or three days, please get back to me. Within like a minute, he's like, here's all your instructions. No problem. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Jesus. I'm like, he has he's, 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 you know, this is no, chocolate. And he, he didn't get any of it because he works remotely. So he was oh. in the office. And I was just like, well, oh. rip you. Yeah. Son of a bitch. We all right. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to put together a community package for Leo. I yes. know that he's new yeah. to the company and everything. He does work remotely, but we're gonna send him some love down the road. I don't know in what capacity, but we're gonna make sure that he's taken care of. Uh yeah. that hey, said we got, we got sponsors. We got sponsors. Absolutely send, send him a chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. a chair uh uh you know we have all kinds of great things that we can send them because we have mark you know this the best sponsors in the world here that's on right the show. absolutely 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 okay uh well that said uh you know I, I i do like the fact that uh you know the consistency that you're talking about eolus about having um you know an annual thing like this a cycle of one calendar year where you know the the champions ladder sort of factors into these events that lead up to a bigger thing, the points tally in and um, coming from my experiences in terms of different, uh, you know, big esports circuits like master series, quote unquote, sometimes the, the biggest bane, the biggest thorn in the side of these things that really derail the momentum is the fact that sometimes they take too long to, to stretch out and all of the, the, the hype and all the momentum gets sort of lost into the ether when you're waiting four to six months from event to event. Mm -hmm. And the, the unfortunate consequence of that is that you get left with um, these seasons, let's say, or these months of the game or these competitive seasons that really don't have any implication to anything. So it's like, why am I even playing? And, and again, that sort of leads back to the fact that people really crave, uh, a ranking system and to be to make sure that the games that they're playing really matter and they can sort of evaluate their skill and mark i just uh, before we kind of move on and wrap things up i want to mm. get your thoughts on on the esports circuit with Mythgard and what you'd like to see and what you anticipate to see yeah, i think uh what he also is correct about like having more support for if the third you know third party uh tournaments uh maybe gaining points towards the some sort of pro ranking because uh, that's something that I think is really important that other games kind of don't kind of miss the mark on where uh, oh, only their official tournaments are giving this. And it's like, well, there's so many other tournaments that take place and some people can't always go to lands. Some people can't participate in everything. Some people can't sit and grind out a million games in, in, in a month, you know, like so there's there should be other ways to gain points. You know, and Hearthstone does it right where they have the HCT points and you can you know, gain them from other events run by third party, or you can play in a lot of their online qualifiers. And there's other ways to to get to an event rather than just, oh, I hit top 100 legend and that's the only way I'm going to get in. Uh, so I'd like to see something like that, where that, you know, always that always top legend status is always or top champion status, I should say, would always be a way to do it. But I think there needs to be a way to reward people who are good players, but don't necessarily have time to grind out games that way but are still smart and good at playing the game who can compete on that level. So I'd like to see something, something like that. Give them chocolate. Yeah. That's a... chocolate. <laughs> just, and your list is going to be there. Dresses of Valkyrie, just flinging chocolates at people off the back of a bicycle, uh, a yeah. motorcycle. Oh Love it. God, that sounds amazing. Wouldn't it be <laughs> badass? I mean, yeah they've for the bigger tournaments i mean i don't know what their circuit is going to be like or, or what it's going to shape up to be but for their big bigger kind of you know like put some show into it have someone show up you know or you know hanging off the back of like a low rider just flinging you know hershey's kisses at people like that would be <laughs> freaking amazing and anyway, there you go these, that's a tournament <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's just part of my own the personal fantasy is having chocolate flung at my face at all times of the day. But that's I mean, we we my all agrees on motorbikes, right? Got it. Hey, yeah. man. Sure, why not? I mean, I'm no. not going to say no. Uh, you know, some of the art is very provocative and and enticing. <laughs> um, yeah, butt girl. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's like one more so, thing. You you and I are very experienced in the world of doing lands. That's something I was going to say as well. I'd love to see the community get large enough to where we could throw some sort of land thing as well. Cause that's something we did in the past. I think those went really well, especially with small communities that are tight knit. And this right. one feels like a nice tight knit community right now. And I'd love to see that grow more. So hopefully as the game grows and it gets more of an esports situation going, 
I'd love to see more community land scenarios because online qualifiers are fun, but lands are where it's at. That's where the parties happen. That's where you get to hang out with people and it's just a, a ton of fun. Right. Well, that's part of the, um, the appeal of it too. And that's kind of where I believe esports is sort of heading to is not necessarily a participator sport, but a spectator sport as well. Yeah. And for sure. Just by, and just to sort of prove my point is that I had options to buy tickets for Overwatch League that was going to be happening here in Toronto. Ooh. And I think, and oh, and I was, I was geared up. I signed up for their newsletter to get the first dibs on tickets. I was part of their, fan club and everything just so that when the first drop of tickets came here in toronto for me to buy i'd have first dips and i did and i was super excited and i looked i'm like all right oh damn i could get front row center let's find out okay four hundred dollars a ticket Jesus. i'll pass on those let's check, <laughs> Woo. let's let's check like the 10 rows back three hundred dollars a ticket <sighs> okay let's pass on that let's check like the back row a hundred and seventy five dollars a ticket for like balcony seats. I was like, forget it. And the and all that's to say is that there's an actual demand for this because the yeah. spectator sport aspect of it is cool. Now, card games, I would argue, are as exciting to sort of watch and dissect as an Overwatch game. And now an Overwatch game obviously has a lot more fast paced action, but turn based games have an appeal in themselves. And like you said, Mark, you and I have sort of organized previous lands before and you don't necessarily need a massive um, player base of millions and millions of players in order to get this to go because we did it in a game that had a small footprint in North America and we made it uh, a very, very successful event twice with, thousands, with twice with thousands yeah. of viewers on Twitch. And we did, we did it. We did so uh, as well. So I do, I do kind of agree to you with you on that one, that community based, um, events possibly yeah. with chocolate sponsorships as well and well and also look yeah. at how many lands happen with uh, hearthstone and magic you know there's so well magic's different i guess but hearthstone specifically look how many lands have, even with the just the tavern gatherings that they did for a while yeah. i think they still do those but like that was a, that Fire was a sides. cool thing man yeah they partnered with buffalo wild wings remember that then they yeah. were like all across uh north america you go to a buffalo wild wings and they were doing these tavern you go there at like 10 in the morning have a beer and play hearthstone <laughs> it's Hell like the best yeah. thing ever Mythgard, when association with M and M's brings you, you <laughs> oh know, no no that's unhealthy right <laughs> and we have like oh, Team yeah. Peanut versus Team Plane and it's oh, like my. unhealthy Team what Crunch could we be like what could we be sponsored by or what could they be sponsored by that wouldn't be we're not going to be like oh yeah mm. sponsored by carrots like of course it's going to be like M and M's or like beer yeah. or something and the beautiful part about it is like M and M's with the different colors kind of look like gems right it's yeah. the Mythgard oh, goodness, vegan Mythgard, series like. What about like Mythgard themed M and M's? Well, well, that'd be cool. Like, with the M on there. Hello, <laughs> it's already an M. Packs. Give us a call. We're all over yeah, this. Yeah, it's free for you if you just cut us in on like ten percent of the M and M production. It's really? all we yeah, want. Like free, kind of. No. Yeah, no, free. Screw it. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. I want free M and M's. Anybody <laughs> especially the M M&M and M company. Send me some Mars. M&Ms. Is it the Mars? Brand? Mars. Yeah, Mars it's makes M and M's. Yep. Perfect. Well. That's how he goes. All right. Well, <laughs> that uh, will conclude that part of the por- uh, of the um, the podcast. We're going to come back from the break, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we are going to talk with uh, Aeolus with some community questions geared specifically for her and for her expertise. And we'll be right back right on the other side of this break. All right, so part of the joy of doing this podcast is being able to bring it to you, the listener, but as well as taking some of your feedback, your criticisms, and of course, your questions. All right, so the first community question, and uh, I possibly the only serious one that we received, uh, is from <laughs> Doggy House. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Reddit. And Doggy House says, Aeolus, as a popular female streamer, what advice would you have? For other aspiring women who want to get started streaming CCGs, what unique challenges and boons do you see for women in a field traditionally dominated by men? It's an interesting one because I feel like everyone's experiences as a female streamer in CCGs have have varied because 
I've potentially been quite sheltered in the communities that I've been in. So I haven't really thought about the fact for the longest time about being a, a female streamer of CCGs because the community didn't really focus on that at all. I didn't get a lot of trolls. Um, it was more when I went into larger communities or streamed games outside of CCGs as that's where you tend to to start getting a little bit, um, I don't know, not more trolls, but more more hatred, I guess. We, right. I don't know. Weird, weird people appear when you stream stuff like WoW and things like that. They just come out of the woodwork. Oh, um, a girl. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's weird. Um, but they, um, in CCGs, I think that the communities are generally really supportive. You are always going to stand out a little bit because it is male dominated. Um, in the line of work that I do, I'm a, um, like in my, my personal life, I'm a, the lead dealer of an investment firm and that's a traditionally really male dominated area. Um, so I'm kind of used to it. I'm kind of used to uh, people assuming what I'm doing is a little bit, a little bit strange. Um, I think just get started and and look at how you're going to think about how you're going to deal with any feedback from people that's not so nice before you do it because one thing that tripped me up is I didn't expect it I was a bit uh, I was a bit naive when it came to to twitch and things um and I hadn't sort of planned for what I would do if a troll came into the stream or if someone came into the stream and you know was sort of picking on me for being a female in the space um and that was one of the things where if I thought to myself, okay, if this happens, I'm going to do X, it would have been a lot easier for me. Um, so that's what the streaming side of things is just accepting that there are going to be people out there who aren't very kind, but you're probably going to find less of them in the smaller CCG communities who are normally really welcoming. Um, for the actual <laughs> playing the CCGs themselves, you tend to get a little bit less respect for being a female I guess um I know that there are uh, female streamers who compete and who are really fantastic and struggle to find any form of respect from um some of their fellow competitors but I'd like to think it's changing I'd like to think less people care about the gender of the person that they're that they're playing against and that it's more acceptable for anyone to be doing it but I don't know I might have a little bit of a naive outlook on the world I tend to think the best of people until they prove otherwise so i think that the you know there's there's it would be obviously naive and stupid of me to believe that there's a, a full-on equality going on in terms of how people oh, yeah, perceive yeah. It, that's just it's not true uh, yeah. what i will say is that there's a lot of uh, positive trend that i'm at least i mean i've been streaming ccgs for over two years two to three years i've been playing them for 20 years uh there are more and more uh females you know there's a lot of women who are playing the games at high levels that kick the crap out of me all the time and i mean that has <laughs> nothing to do like skill is is not gender based it has nothing yeah. to do with it the intellect that you have and the experience that you have and the way that that sort of transcends it, transcends itself into how you play a game has nothing to do with your biology it has nothing to do with yeah. that it's just it's purely how you play the game um and i mean i'll i'll be first to say that when i the people I follow, I have followed in uh, purely based on what I'm, you know, uh, what appeals to me from uh, an entertainment perspective and my friends and whatnot. But there are a lot of people, male and female, in a, in a nice balance who are reaching high ends on the ladder, be it uh, people like Alias and uh, Ash Lizzle and Magic, who I've, I've watched and played various games who always, you know, they hit Mythic in that game. And for instance, you hitting uh, Mithril tier in uh, in Mythgard, uh, etc. So uh, it's very encouraging to see that there's, like you said, there's a lot of people who just don't give a shit, and the people who yeah. do give a shit about it are not worth the time, anyways. Yeah. They're just there to I, cause a ruckus, anyways. Yeah, I, I guess if they if I go back to them asking for any advice for people wanting or them wanting to, it was wanting to stream CCGs, right? A female streamer in the Correct. CCG space. Yeah, so I guess I would suggest potentially starting with the smaller CCGs. So I know that sounds like a strange thing when you're a streamer trying to sort of get out there, but I, I just have had far less toxicity in the smaller communities um, for being a female anyway. Like I was just trying to think back and I've had one that I can remember anyway, one comment 
about being apart apart from the odd like sexualized trolls, but like one comment about being a female from streaming these smaller games. I think it was something along the lines of, "Oh, um, if you had a male brain, you would have seen the line." Something Oof. like that. It was like a pretty <laughs> poor troll. Like it Jeez. was a really like baseline of you would have seen that if you had a male brain. Um, and that was the only one that I can think of over that time. So I think not being afraid to just jump in, like not uh, yeah, not going in with the expectation that you're going to be given grief for it because most of the people you want, 90% of the people are lovely. Maybe not yeah. 90%. 80% it's... of the... <laughs> 67% of the people that you'll meet online are lovely. So. Yeah. That, oh, a, resp- a response my response would be like, and if you were hugged enough as a child, you wouldn't be getting banned right now on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I don't even know if I acknowledged it. I think I just kind of, yeah, know. you I don't, don't ever, know. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a straight up ignore and ban. <laughs> well, and it, trolling comes in a lot of forms and, and facets, and it's just like it's like what are you doing? Just who are you impressing? What the hell's the yeah? Point of why all this? why? I, I think you make a good point about uh, the smaller games because in in my experience, uh, I I feel like the smaller CCGs have a little bit of a mature audience. Uh, generally, like uh, I know that. When I first started streaming Gwent, it seemed to be an older audience. So they were a little bit more mature in that sense. Not that they're, you know, there's trolls in every game, but they, they seem to be a lot less likely and you ran into a lot less in, in smaller games. Uh, but Magic in particular is one where um, that one is kind of a little bit, has a bad notor- uh, notoriety for being a little bit sexist in, in certain areas. But uh, yeah. But yeah, the the larger the game gets, usually the easier, the more it's going to be that you run into trolls and all that craziness. But but you also got to pick a game that you're good at. You know, you got to pick a game that you're comfortable playing, that you're good at, that you are going to enjoy streaming. Yeah, yeah, you know, pick a game that you enjoy for the most part. You can tell when you're watching a streamer who doesn't like what they're playing. It yeah. doesn't matter if they're male or female. If you're watching someone who's not enjoying it, oh my god, why then would that's not fun for you. Yeah, right. It's not fun for the viewer. So yeah. Well, these have been all uh, excellent, excellent um, discussions. Honestly, thank you so much to everybody, uh, specifically uh, you, the listeners who are picking up these frequencies here, and to our special guest, Eolus, all the way, who woke up early just for me, has nothing to do <laughs> with the fact that there is a closed beta that began a, a couple hours ago. But uh, I'm thank so you so much. Excited. I, that's why we're working. I wrap this up so you can go ahead and dive in. You said something you had like something like it was like 2047 packs to open or something, something like that. No, it was close. 58 specifically. Oh, yes, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, just uh, give or take. But uh, that's, that's like a two uh, hour. That's like an hour or two hours. <laughs> are you going to make a, a, a show out of it? Or are you going to record it, make some uh, some type of content out of it? I'll stream. Um, I probably won't um, like youtube it because i've recently done a hundred card pack opening for Mythgard for the youtube channel um but so i probably won't make it a twitch highlight but i will definitely be streaming the packs and then seeing what we're gonna do go full prestige out the bat beautiful well you had that full prestige valkyrie list if i'm not mistaken oh, yeah. right pride and, and joy already. and it's gone and it's, now it's gone. gone now it's gone yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again for appearing on the show uh, on episode two of The Boneyard. And for those who do not know where to find you, just give us a little bit of your coordinates, when and where they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So most commonly, the place where you can find me live will be twitch.tv slash Aeolus, which is E-O-L-I-S. Good luck working out the vowels with my accent. Um, On uh, YouTube, I think it is... uh, Eolus TV. I think we had to sneak a TV in there because someone had the Eolus. And it is also Eolus TV on Twitter as well, which I'm there every day being a pest. Well, welcome. Thank you again so much. Uh, this has been really enlightening and I'm very, very excited uh, for the future, not only of the game, which is in closed beta as of today, but uh, for your bright future as well with the game and seeing where this goes. So, uh, oh, once again. You Oh, it's my sincere pleasure. Again, thank you very much for being on the show. Mark. Yes, sir. Another one in the books, my friend. Will there be a Revenge of the Sith version of this? I mean, we got to keep naming him after Star Wars movies now. What are we going to do when we get to uh, Return of the Jedi? Or actually, what are we going to do when we get to the new Star Wars movie? What's the new gonna, story? Uh, well, uh, the Rise of the Skywalker. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rise of the Skywalker. But, but if we can get to like an episode nine, that's already a pretty significant. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. 
I mean, it's it, what's the old adage about restaurants? If like most restaurants, like ninety percent of restaurants fail within their first year. So yeah, um, if we can get to an episode ten and have to name it after that, well, then that's worth celebrating in itself. So we can worry about it then. Then we'll just go to Star Trek movies, and yeah, then yeah, there's tons things. of those. Sure, there's and then all the other nerdy crap that I have hanging on my walls. So it's no big deal. Uh, Perfect. We've got plenty and plenty and plenty of content to get to. Mark, I know that you are also itching to go stream. Uh, some some pack openings and everything and everyone else out there who is consuming the game right now in closed beta. Welcome. Open beta is around the corner on September 19th. Enjoy yourselves. Mark, thanks again for, uh, you know, pushing all the buttons and making me look good. Oh, you know, it's my thing. Yeah, you do it. You do it well. You're a <laughs> wizard. You're a wizard. But you're not that much of a wizard because we're not in video. A lot? <laughs> uh, you do a lot. You do a lot, I say. All right, Mark, anything, uh, any final parting shots you'd like to give? No, let's go. Let's go rip open some packs, man. All right. Well, uh, just don't actually rip your, you know, your computer screen open because that would, <laughs> I might get that excited. That. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, for Mark and myself, thank you so much for joining us here on the Boneyard. And again, special thanks to Eolus and our sponsors, Team Rank Star and Inked Gaming. And of course, you guys out there in Radio Land. Thank you for listening because otherwise we would just be talking to ourselves. So thank you so much. Adios.